breakthrough? When has your persistence led to a breakthrough? I can think of a few times in my life, but I'll share with you the most recent and quite bizarre occasion when my persistence led to a breakthrough. Throughout most of this year, I've struggled with really bad allergies and very itchy eyes. I've mentioned this to you before in another service, and I'll be honest with you and say that I, I'm not the most proactive with getting help when I, when, in general when I need it, but also when I'm unwell, I'm not very proactive. Um, but this year, with the encouragement of my family, I've been trying to do all the sensible things that you should do. Um, I've gone to the pharmacy, spoken on the phone to a doctor, uh, had an appointment with a nurse practitioner, uh, and then they started wondering, oh, perhaps it's not allergies that's making your eyes so bad. And so then they refer me to the eye clinic at Southlands to see an ophthalmologist. But after I was referred, all I received was a letter, not offering me an appointment, but telling me someone would get in contact to offer me an appointment. And then six weeks went by, I know some of this will be familiar to some of you, six weeks went by and still nothing, I haven't heard anything. And so I get in touch with my doctors again and ask if they can help me. And that's when I experienced what uh, can only be called a computer says no moment. Have you ever had one of those computer says no moments? The receptionist, without any apology or sympathy, said that normally it takes between six months and a year to get an appointment at the eye clinic, and that it was unheard of for, for a person to get one sooner. That, that was how she saw things. But she said that I could ring a number and find out about the status of my referral to Southlands. So I ring this number and wait on hold for an hour. And, and who gets to choose that on hold music? <laughs> Seriously. Someone eventually picked up and they told me that they can't help me. Um, my heart sinks at this moment. They said that I've got the wrong number. And uh, she said that I need to ring ophthalmology directly um, and gives me their phone number but warns me that their lines are probably the same as theirs. Uh, just as busy. So I have to think, am I prepared to wait on hold for another hour? I think, what choice do I have? Um, so I endure more terrible music, only 20 minutes of it this time, thankfully. And then there's this bizarre moment. Someone picks up the phone, I tell her the situation and what's going on, and she offers me an appointment the next morning to see an ophthalmologist. I couldn't believe it. I don't know if it was a cancellation or what, but I just go from, I go from expecting six months to a year to being like, oh yeah, you can come in tomorrow. It's, it's absolutely fine. And uh, just to put you, your, uh, I don't, don't want you to worry about me. The ophthalmologist said, everything's fine. It's just allergies. My actual eyes are fine, blah, blah, blah. Um, still have allergies, unfortunately, but uh, at least there's nothing major wrong with my eyes. But I wonder if you've experienced anything like this before, whether it's this kind of thing or something more you have, yeah. Wow, wow. But yeah, it just, uh, it became very, a bit like stress, um, you know, waiting for, for what is that? Yeah. Actually, I'm trying to stop it, Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's so hard to persist when um, it feels like it's all against you. And I was thinking, I was thinking for me, why did I stay on the phone? Why did I keep going? Why, when I found out I've got the wrong number, did I then go and carry on? I think interesting questions come from asking why. Why do we persist? At some point, it is going to do right by us. Why do we keep hoping for justice? And I realised that my situation, it wasn't really a justice issue. It was very, and if it was, it was a micro, micro justice issue. Um, but let's think bigger about justice. Where does the energy to seek justice in society come from? Where does the energy to seek justice in our world come from? Why did, for example, women keep campaigning for the vote despite so many setbacks and imprisonments? Why did Martin Luther King Jr. keep protesting against segregation even though his life was threatened many times? Why, did, um, why does David Attenborough, for example, at 96, 96, he still has the energy to speak out about climate change? What keeps him going? How do we keep hope alive 
And how do we protect ourselves from despair? I realise it's a bit taboo to talk about despair. We don't talk about despair much in church. No one wants to say the word, perhaps because it sounds so desperate, so bleak. And I realise that it can be. I wonder if it can show up in everyday life as well. When someone says, today will be much the same as yesterday. Nothing new will happen. Nothing will change. And sometimes those kinds of phrases, they appear kind of like cynical or rational or maybe learned or wise. But the belief that things will not change and nothing new will happen is often despair. Despair. Jesus must have seen this, or at least seen it coming for his disciples. His concern was that in the face of injustice, they might give up praying, perhaps even give up altogether. So he gave them this story. We're going to hear this story, a, a parable to encourage them to keep hope alive. And we're going to hear that story now. And Helen's going to come and read for us. The parable of the persistent widow. That's Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Then she would have been tempted, the widow would have been tempted to give up. I picture her waking up one morning weary and cold. She has no firewood because her husband is dead and her relatives won't carry out their obligation to provide for her. Shall I go to see the judge again, she might say. Will today be just the same as yesterday? What's the point? Nothing new will happen. Nothing will change. We'd understand, wouldn't we, if she, if she felt like that? She was experiencing that despair. And yet she doesn't. She keeps showing up at the court, probably at the most inconvenient moments. If the parable was being told today, we might picture the judge pulling into his parking space in his nice car and the widow standing in the space and he can't get his car in. Or perhaps he's getting lunch at the canteen and it's the widow that passes him his apple for his lunch and she's looking him in the eye. Or perhaps as he's leaving the office, she jumps out from a bush and there she is again, the widow, appearing at the most inconvenient moments, each time looking him in the eye and saying, grant me justice against my adversary. But the judge can only take so much. He's worried that one day she's going to show up at his house, scare his wife and kids. And so he says, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And so the widow changed the unjust judge's mind through her persistence. What can we learn from this widow? That if we're persistent, we will eventually change the minds of those in power and get justice? Well, that's not a bad application. And we know from history that that is indeed how things often work. Persistent struggle with injustice can change the world. This is why we sign petitions, campaign, join marches, write to MPs, give to charities that organise such action. However, if this is all we took from this parable, we'd be placing the emphasis on our effort, on our human effort and ignoring Jesus' reason for telling the parable. The Gospel writer Luke tells us that Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And then after telling the parable, he says, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice. And quickly, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So Jesus says, when you are experiencing injustice, keep praying. Why? Because God is 
infinitely better than an unjust human judge. If even an unjust human judge will grant justice eventually, you can expect God to grant justice quickly. And then he makes reference to his second coming. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And this is where it gets a bit tricky. The early church, those first readers and listeners of Luke's gospel would have been expecting Jesus to return very, very soon. And when he came, they were expecting God's kingdom of justice and peace to arrive in fullness. But years went by, and decades went by, and centuries went by. And here we are, still waiting for the kingdom to come in fullness. We continue to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We keep hoping. And we see these bursts, these little bursts of justice overcoming injustice. And yet we don't see God swooping in and overriding us and overriding our will to bring about justice. And so where is the good news when the arrival of God's justice rarely, if ever, feels quick and as final as it's portrayed in this passage? Where is the good news here? Because we're still waiting for the kingdom. Well, Jesus recommends persistent prayer, communication with a God who is infinitely more just than any human judge. The persistent widow had to change the judge's mind, but we don't have to change God's mind. God's mind is already made up for justice, fixed on justice. In fact, in the Judeo-Christian worldview, justice comes from God. God is the source of justice. And if that's the case, then prayer should not look like bargaining with God or begging or pleading. Prayer is not communication with just another unjust judge. It's communication with the source, with the source of justice. Persistent prayer is not a way of us getting God on board with our agenda. It's a way of God getting us on board with God's justice agenda. Prayer is a way of reminding ourselves, and this is hopeful, reminding ourselves that justice exists independent of us. God's justice exists independent of us, regardless of the state of the world as we see it, regardless of our strength to struggle for justice, regardless of our ability to change the mind of someone in power. Justice is safe with God. Justice comes from God and shines down on us like the sun. And yet people frustrate it. People get in the way of it, it's a bit like the clouds getting in the way of the sun, but it keeps breaking through the clouds. We keep seeing these bursts and this hope. Justice is actually quick, it's shining down quick. It's often we who are slow when we obstruct it. So here's some good news for you and for me today, because when you feel like saying, today will be much the same, as yesterday. Nothing new will happen, nothing will change. You are invited to keep hope alive through prayer, realigning yourself with the source, with the one from whom justice comes, the one from whom all good gifts come. You might feel like despairing, I don't know where you're at this morning, but you might feel like despairing, but God is the source of all sorts of possibilities and potential and hope and second chances. And God remains this way, whether or not you see much hope in your world at this particular time. This might sound oversimplistic to you, but a person can only struggle for justice if they actually believe in it. And if they're not seeing much of it around, if we're not seeing much justice around us, we need to believe in it in an even deeper way. We need to trust it. We need to keep in touch with it. We need to carry it around with us. We need to align ourselves with it daily. We need to keep dreaming the dream. And these are deeply spiritual things. A struggle for justice needs a spiritual underpinning. And in the Christian tradition, this is prayer. 
you can persistently pray to the source of justice, not asking that God gets on board with our agenda, but that you will get on board with God's. And prayer can lead to great conviction that justice is for you and for everyone else and for the planet, because this is how God sees it. And by communicating with the source of justice, you can gain energy and conviction for engaging with the unjust judges of our world, and there are many. That's the difference prayer can make. It's the source. It's the way we can get conviction. It's the energy. Prayer can keep hope alive. So how do we keep hope alive? How do we protect ourselves from despair? One way is prayer. We could despair. We could despair and say today will be much the same as yesterday. Nothing new will happen. Nothing will change. Or we could communicate with the source of justice and the source of all sorts of possibilities and potential and hope and second chances. We could look down and fixate on all the ways justice is being obstructed that we can see in our world today. Or we could look up and see that justice comes from God and is at every moment shining on the earth, inviting people to bask in its light. We could obstruct justice or we could align ourselves with it. We could gradually stop believing in justice or we could keep in touch with it, carry it around with us, keep dreaming the dream through prayer. And this sermon, it has to end in a particular place. It has to end with hope, because the Christian faith is all about hope. The Christian faith pushes back on the idea that today will be much the same as yesterday. Nothing new will happen. Because in the beginning, God created something out of nothing. That was new. And at the right time, God came in human flesh. That was new. And when all was lost, Jesus was raised from the dead. That was new. And when the disciples were missing the presence of their Lord, the presence of Jesus, his spirit came upon them. That was new. And with God's track record, as a basis, we are invited by the scriptures to hope that, yes, things will get even better. That death will be swallowed up in victory. Tears will be wiped away. And justice, peace and love will reign. And God will live with us forever and ever. And so we live in hope. Amen.